Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast, Marcus with Chip Nellinger. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. If you're looking for a free uh, flashlight, Chip, I'll tell you what, this is it right here. Not only is it a flashlight, you can take, Heavy the, duty top right off, there. take the top off and you got this cutter thing right here, like you got a seatbelt deal. Let's see if I can get to come in there. Just look at your seatbelt, smash the glass with this tip right here plus the flashlight on the other end so it's like like a swiss army knife for flashlights if you want one of those just go send an email to marketing at axontire.com with all your information and they will send you one free in the mail just tell them the moving iron podcast sent you so there you go chip next time i it, might do that next time something crazy happens at your house you're gonna have a swiss army knife for a flashlight that's right be able to fight your way out a weapon and a light here you go all right. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. And Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment, whether it's from a dealer, an auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. For more information about your financing options, go to agdirect.com. Chip Nellinger is with Blue Reef Agri-Marketing out of Morton, Illinois, and he's nice enough to come on and talk about what's going on in the market. So, Chip, how are you doing this morning? Hey, doing well, Casey. It's uh, we're getting into getting into summer here. We can turn the calendar to June, so uh, yep. this thing is uh, progressing rapidly into the growing season. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, th- things are moving right along. We had a we had a bunch of rain come through here um, over the weekend. I bet we probably got uh, two inches of rain, if not close to that, over the over the course of the weekend. Turn off a little cooler than than uh, what we what we see like the right what we would like right now, but I'm not gonna complain about the rain because it's uh, it was it's so dry that we got an inch and a half of rain or more and still driving down the gravel roads with dust behind me. So that shows you how dry it is out here. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> pretty bad. It's much much needed for sure. Yes, very much so. All right, let's talk about uh, crop progress and conditions reports right now. Pretty much caught up across the board. You know, corn is. Planted is up where it's supposed to be. Emergence is where it's supposed to be. Emergence is just a little back behind, about 7% or so. But soybeans are right on track across the board. And you look at wheat, wheat's still a struggle. You know, you've got uh, 73% of the spring wheat planted. Um, 92% is the average right now. So that the northern plains are still still struggling to get stuff put in. Uh, winter wheat, um, 72% is headed, but still it's you know, only 29% of that's rated good to excellent. Last week it was 28%, so it popped up about 1%, but, you know, give or take on that. So if you look across the board there, Chip, as you look at that, what are your thoughts there, and how is the market reacting to that? Yeah, a little bit of a mixed bag there. I mean, even though the numbers uh, kind of caught up, like you, you mentioned, uh, here we are June 1st, and where we are behind continues, uh, continue to be behind <clears throat> are the far northern plains there, North Dakota, Minnesota, um, you know, are two big ones that, that stick out there and they've, um, you know, kind of struggled with, uh, too much rain. So it's like, it, it's feast or famine, you know, you guys, uh, you mentioned that, uh, two inches of rain, if you got it, uh, was, you know, ideal because you're so far, uh, below normal, uh, rainfall right now, even going back into last summer and fall and the poor guys up North, they just wanted to quit raining for a couple of weeks so they can finish up, uh, planting and, and some field work. So, you know, a little bit of a mixed bag. I, I think um, given how late it is, you know, you, you can, uh, uh, you know, expect that we're going to see some prevent plant. And then there's even pockets. We to talked to some producers here, um, uh, even in Southern Illinois, where it has been too wet uh, for too long. Now they're, they're probably not uh, too terrible on beans, but there are some producers that have uh, switched over or intending to switch over some acres of corn two beans it just got too late for the corn and so it's just um it's it's not great it's everywhere it's not perfect everywhere it is in some areas however and uh that's what the market's trying to grapple with is you know what i'm going to get the rest of this in the ground what's that mean to prevent plant uh, how many prevent plant acres how many acres switch from corn uh to beans uh in the south uh, they have the same problem and it's probably not a necessarily a, a corn to bean switch maybe but a, a corn to cotton switch uh they're struggling with wet weather there and so uh you know in this whole uh, you know kettle or stew of market information that's what the market is trying to trying to kind of grapple with here you've you've been um the, the market is uncertain about 
this potential for this uh, supposed meeting coming up here next week that is going to uh, take place with different parties, Russia, Ukraine, maybe Turkey moderating that uh, about allowing some humanitarian exports of grain out of the Black Sea area. Um, you know, obviously that would uh, ease some of the supply tightness that we see. The wheat and the corn markets uh, really uh, didn't like that uncertainty. I think there's a small percentage chance that that's going to happen. Uh, to me, it's more of a ploy to get some sanctions lifted and, uh, you know, some ports demined so that, um, you know, it's good for Russia. And I'm not sure that the world is ready to, um, you know, bow to them quite that way this early on. So that uncertainty with that small possibility chance, uh, the planting conditions, planting progress, catching up a little bit, I think, um, you know, wait on the markets in here uh, the last couple of days into the end of last week and uh, to start uh, this short week off uh, yesterday. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. We saw the entire growing season ahead of us and right. it's it, not all on the ground yet. So there's still going to be some volatility, some rally chances. I don't feel like that the high is in. Uh, certainly you could break a little deeper and you know, probably wouldn't be unhealthy for the market um, to break a little bit more and and then kind of, you know, play out that whole uncertainty of, you know, all right, how hot's it going to get? Is it getting dry anywhere? How's pollination? How's grain fill? Uh, you know, how, how are bean pods set? I've got a lot of weather ahead of us. So uh, this thing's going to just get more and more volatile, uh, especially in the backdrop of you know, this war going on and, and the Black Sea being, uh, you know, closed for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about ethanol for just a minute. If you take a look at what's going on there, we got incredibly high prices uh, at the pump and you've got, that, that's usually very, very favorable for, for ethanol production, what you look like there. But if you go look at what the crush report for April is going to look like, um, there's a lot of speculation there that they're expecting it to be down um, from the previous months now running up to April. Uh, all through every other month that we've had up there, there's just been record crush amounts, whether it's been corn or bean crush, whatever it was. Talk about that a little bit. We'll let you see happen there. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you look, take a step back and look at the big picture of the last uh, two or three years, uh, yeah, obviously you've got the COVID situation thrown in there, sure. but let's go back five years. You know, we were at a pretty high uh, level here. So, you know, that that crush uh, of for ethanol has... Um, really uh, increased. And, you know, the USDA has slowly ramped that up over time. There is some capacity issues. Uh, you know, I think the the industry's maybe uh, up against that uh, as well. So there's some give and take there. But I think as you look at the trend, throw out the, you know, the, the COVID uh, period there where it just kind of messed everything up uh, in a lot of different industries. And we're on a pretty steady grind higher. And, and so, you know, I, I think that things still look um, strong there. The, the question is going to be, does high price gasoline start curbing demand, right? I mean, that's that's to me the big question. We're going to keep grinding this stuff. Uh, I think ethanol usage is going to be strong. But eventually, high prices cure high prices. And, and, you know, the reason for those sayings are the cure for low prices or low prices, the cure for high prices or high prices is because in a high price environment, you slow demand down. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. a pretty simple economic uh, uh, fact. And so is this five, $6 plus gasoline going to uh, start slowing things down, uh, you know, causing a cut in, in driving, uh, people not going on vacations, people not driving as much. And, and if that's going to be the case, then, you know, likely uh, ethanol is going to kind of peak and follow um, gasoline demand. So that's the biggest question. You know, to some extent, um, I, I think it has, but maybe not to the extent that, um, you know, maybe I, I would have expected. Maybe that's yet to come. So in my, my mind, the biggest question is uh, this high price gasoline. When does that start um, getting a, into the consumer pocket enough that they make some major changes and stay at home? And I think that's, you know, the question across a lot of the sectors, um, you know, the beef side can, you know, same thing can be said there. Uh, are high prices inflation going to 
um, you know, start changing consumer demand. And, and if and when it does, uh, that's going to affect a lot of things. Ethanol grind, uh, protein consumption, probably even, um, you know, corn, bean, uh, you know, grain demand uh, in general. So that's the battle we've got going on is how long is inflation going to rage? When does the consumer uh, demand slow down? That's going to be kind of a, a tightrope, uh, you know, dance that we um, face for several months. And some of that's going to be crop size related, right? So we mm -hmm. talked earlier about the, the weather. So there's all these issues in there that the market's going to be highly sensitive to. Uh, first and foremost, it's, it's, uh, it's weather and production. So th that's going to be the biggest driver here over the next, uh, you know, say, two and a half, three months, but all those other issues about, you know, demand and, you know, total aggregate demand given high prices and high fuel costs are, are really going to be what uh, we need to keep close eye on. Yep. Okay. So you brought up beef. That was the next question I was going to come up to you with. If you look at what's going on in the cash markets right now, um, they're kind of back and forth a little bit, but for the most you know, most cases they're on, on average, they're, they're on their way up. So I guess, as you look at there, you look at herd size, all these things are going on. We're in grilling season, but you're still paying, you know, five, six, seven dollars a pound for hamburger at the, uh, at the grocery store. So to your point, where does that breaking point happen with beef? Yeah. Again, you know, this, this balancing act, this dance between supply demand, um, you know, consumer, uh, uh, financial strength, I guess. Uh, so far, it doesn't seem like it's hurt too terribly bad. I, I think the one thing that's helped us over the last uh, 12, 18 months is really strong uh, export demand. We need to kind of uh, monitor that going forward. That's helped clear some of these large uh, uh, stocks of beef that we have. Uh, the re most recent cold storage report certainly wasn't friendly. I, I believe it was one of, if not the uh, highest uh, you know, amount of beef in storage since they've been doing uh, those cold storage reports. So um, I think it's just that, that slow transition. We should be towards the back end of this where, um, you know, the, the cow slaughter, the, the heifer slaughter has put a lot of extra beef uh, on the market. And I would just think that we got to be getting close to the end of that. Um, you know, the drought situation hasn't fixed itself very well. There wasn't a lot of uh, healing of that over the winter time frame. And certainly there, there hasn't been a great rainfall in those driest areas so far this, this spring. So, you know, I, I think the other shoe is coming quickly where once we stop and slow that, you know, beef and, and cow slaughter and then start retaining heifers and taking those back off the market, things are going to shrink up dramatically. And, and uh, the only question then is, does demand hold together? So there are a lot of questions going forward. It's going to cause a lot of volatility. I think yesterday was just one of those days. It was the end of a trading month. Sure. And, yeah. um, you know, it just seemed like everything was uh, caught up and just, you know, a, a massive sell-off. And, and so it's going to be interesting to see the first two or three trading days of June here. Uh, was that just kind of a one-off type thing? Or is that the start of a you know, more of a uh, kind of a profit-taking mode by some of these these funds. So uh, I think maybe the, the cattle market is getting a little stretched to the downside and um, a little overdone based on where cash and box beef uh, is. So we'll see. I think today's action is going to be important. If we see an immediate snapback, uh, you know, buck, buck and a half higher in cattle day, I, I think it was a one-day wonder and just, you know, some end-of-the-month shenanigans there yesterday. Right. Uh, if you have some more weakness today, little concerning that maybe the funds are, you know, uh, kind of jumping the gun a little bit and maybe you want to start building a, a short position in cattle. They haven't done that very often or uh, very recently, but they're about evened up on their longs. And, and if you see continual pressure from here to start June, they're likely going short, probably doesn't bode very well in the, in the short run for prices. Right on. Okay. Well, good stuff as usual, Chip. Folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what it is you're doing at Blue Reef. What's the best way to do that? Yeah, best way is just give us a call at the office. It's 309-550-7213. We'd love to chat with you and, uh, you know, just kind of see, uh, you know, extra set of eyes and ears on your on your risk management plan and how you might be able to make a couple tweaks and uh, improve it, uh, just both from a planning and an execution standpoint. So uh, don't hesitate to call us. Right on. 
Chip, appreciate you being on the podcast, man. Hey, I appreciate being on, Casey. Thanks. All right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC, LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast, and also go to the Moving Iron YouTube channel. Check out and see what, what Chip looks like. He's a, he's a sexy fella. You're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna blow your mind. So check that oh, out. Oh yeah. <laughs> Face for radio, Casey. That's what my mom said. So check that out over there at the YouTube channel. And uh also uh, go to Moving Iron LLC for everything Moving Iron related blogs all the podcasts, everything, also all the information for the Moving Iron Summit coming up in Nashville, Tennessee, September 6th, 7th, and 8th. If you need more information about that, send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at movingironpodcast.com, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can, or you can just sign up right there, and we will get you uh, get you registered. Uh, my friend Alex Trichenko, if you go back and listen to uh, I'll Be Back, Parts 1, 2, and 3, kind of lays out Alex's odyssey there when he got stuck in Ukraine when, when Russia invaded, and kind of goes through that whole that whole episode he's decided to go back to ukraine and help uh pass out humanitarian aid where he can he's bought himself a, a little little cargo van he's gonna fill it full of stuff so he's looking for all the support he can get he's got a gofundme page set up check that out it's uh if you just search help alex transport aid from poland to ukraine you can find that also here in the show notes you'll see that link as well so if you could help alex out that'd be great he's over there doing the doing the lord's work help making sure people got what they need so with that i'm casey seymour with chip nunger let's go this morning, folks out moving iron in the 21st century hard working people working hard for you and me moving iron time and time again through the years you'll find See